Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Film Daily for Monday, April 22nd, 2019. On today's episode, we're going to talk about what we've been up to at the Water Cooler. This is Slash Film Editor-in-Chief Peter Soretta. And joining me at this podcast is Slash Film Managing Editor Jacob Hall. Hello, hello. Senior Writer Ben Pearson. Hey, what's going on? And Writers Huay Tran Bui. Hey, everyone. And Chris Evangelista. Hello, folks. So Brad is out sick today, so we don't have – we have a – Slightly unfull water cooler, but we have a lot to talk about, so let's uh, jump into it. As uh, you know of last week, I'm going to Galaxy's Edge, and I have kind of, uh, I think I've talked about it on this podcast. I want to cover this in a way that I think people would want to watch it, and I don't feel like people uh, people want to read coverage of this new Star Wars theme park land in text with just a few photos. I think they people want to see it. So I, I, I've been t- talking with people. I've talked with Ben about this. I, I want to film this like a uh, like a video blog so that you can like experience it with me. So uh, this past week, I decided to go to Best Buy. I ended up buying a bunch of cameras. I bought three different – or actually, I bought two different digital cameras. I bought uh, the Canon – G7X Mark II. This is a point-and-shoot camera that a lot of uh, my favorite video bloggers use. Uh, the Tim Tracker swears on it. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's very small, very portable, has a screen that flips out, and you can see from the front view. That gives you a good, uh, good, good, you know, selfie vision. Um, and I also bought a Osmo Pocket, which is kind of like this really tiny gyro like camera so it's like very uh stabilized and uh kitra also has a sony uh a6000 camera i think uh so we were we went to disneyland over the weekend with those three cameras and my iphone so we're testing out four different cameras uh we recorded a uh our first attempt an actual vlog uh which i'm gonna probably put up on on my personal channel at some point this week. Um, but te- basically the whole point of it was to test out these these four cameras and see what would be good for Galaxy's Edge and also, you know, to get some experience down, to, to uh, you know, even coming back from Disneyland, to be able to come home. And I, I have not edited on a video editor since uh, probably like 15 years ago. I was using Vegas Video. <laughs> so uh, my friend Jeff came over and gave me kind of a primer on Adobe Premiere and taught me how to edit with that. So um, I, I've been spending some time in front of the computer with Kitra editing together this video blog that we kind of uh, haphazardly shot at Disneyland, which will be out sometime this week. And uh, I can tell you just from the editing process alone, I've learned so much about what I missed when shooting and what I should, what kind of, you know, I need a wide shot of this. I need a close up of the, I need a transition here. It it just, um, it's such a different, uh, way of storytelling that I'm not used to, you know, I've spent so much time in the print world, uh, in, in writing in the, the last 15 years, uh, that like, it's just a whole other tool set. And I, I was talking with you, Ben at uh cinema con, because you did some video coverage there and it, you, it, it seems to be more, um, instinct for you now that you've done so many videos. Yeah, I think so. The, the big key that I would, you know, if I would give you one piece of advice, it's to, overshoot the hell out of everything because as i'm sure you've already realized being in the editing room after just one particular vlog episode um (laughs) you know the the idea of having enough coverage it it almost seems like you never have enough so shoot everything and shoot it multiple ways too that's a big thing um because i i tend to sort of see things in my head a little bit but then it's a collaboration. My videos are a collaboration with my my wife, and sometimes she sees things a little bit differently. So the idea of just shooting something one way, like Robert Rodriguez style, you know, putting it all together in your mind on the fly, um, coverage is sort of a dirty word <laughs> because it implies that you don't have a vision, but uh, options are always nice. I'll say that. I mean, I, I can tell that's a good advice just from editing this. Although I will say, having so many options, I'm we're like halfway through this video blog, editing this video blog, 
and I wanted this video blog to be like 20, 30 minutes max. And we're already like over 20 minutes and like they haven't gotten to half of it. So, oh man, that's the other, that's yeah. the other piece of advice. You have to be ruthless when you cut stuff. Like you only keep the tip top best material and just let everything else go, but you'll learn it as you go. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, when that is online, I will plug it here and everybody can go check that out. Uh, but that's what I've been working on this week. Oh, and I should say, you know, you can watch the video blog when it's up to see what, you know, the different cameras looked like and, you know, what footage we were able to get at the park. But I I really think the Canon G7X Mark II, despite having, you know, the ability to add extra lenses or an external, you know, mic, uh, just provided much better footage overall and was just, like, so much better experience to use in, like, almost every single situation. So I think that's the one we're going to use when we actually go to Galaxy's Edge. But uh, it, you'll see a lot more of that in in the footage when that gets online. Jacob, what have you been up to? Well, it was an interesting thing to happen to me this week, and it may not be interesting to anyone else in the world, <laughs> but I've been playing the same Dungeons & Dragons character for six, seven years now. Uh, he's a human rogue and his name, which is a joke, is Bob Johnson, um, but spelled in like the most Tolkien-esque way you can spell Bob Johnson, but pronounced Bob Johnson. And um, he was designed to be sort of an extremely selfish, cruel, callous criminal who thieves and cons and never see, never uh, avoid an opportunity to kick someone when they're down. And he's very much you know the, the bad guy of the group. And over the years, you know, he started having a transformation. He's um, a little while back, he had a midlife crisis that he um, and he started like instead of being this callous guy, he started being more of a coward who's always questioning himself. And in recent months, he transformed into somebody seeking redemption. Even at, in one dungeon, he encountered a demon that took the form of his younger self. And he had a <laughs> and I rolled a 20, which is the best thing you can roll in Dungeons and Dragons. While trying to convince this younger version of himself that he could change and be a better person, which triggered me to realize that there's nowhere else Bob Johnson can go. Once he learns to be a good person, his story is over. He's no longer an interesting adventurer to follow on these quests. So when we wrapped the most recent adventure, uh, he took a share of the gold. He went home to his family and he survived and he's retired and he's completed his arc as a man who's trying to better himself and be a better father and be there for the people he's abandoned. So right now I'm in the process of building a new character uh, who's going to be starting from scratch and joining the group. So it was a really interesting moment where I know some people play the same character for years and years and years and play in the same way for years and years and years. But uh, it was interesting to sort of organically see a story come to an end in a character where I did not plan that long term. It evolved over time. I know I'm, not, I'm like, I think I'm the big RPG player or tabletop RPG player uh in this conversation right now i'm curious if anybody else has had like this kind of experience with any kind of uh, media where they were something they were creating took an unexpected turn like this <laughs> i can't think oh. of any kind of story that i would have participated in that that is as interactive and um you know that that's outside of like a video game or something where you you end up having so much control over the narrative i i don't think i don't think so I, I know I have uh, the board game Gloomhaven, which I haven't played yet, but uh, I'm excited to get that to the table. I j just had a hard time getting it to the table, and I know part of that is kind of Dungeons & Dragons inspired, where you're playing the same character, you know, session after session after session, and at some point your character either dies or retires, and you have to, like, move on to another character. And that the prospect of that, Jacob, scares the heck out of me. <laughs> like, I, I feel like... You know, when you are investing so much into this one character and then, like, you have to leave that behind, I don't know, that's, like, scary on a, like, almost, like, human level. <laughs> <laughs> There's a game I've talked about in the past called Blades in the Dark, which is a, my favorite RPG design of all time. It's because your character, who is a criminal in a fantasy world, when bad stuff happens to them, you take permanent effects. You, like, you check off options on your character sheet that um, either 
make you uh, give you physical impairments, uh, emotional impairments, mental impairments. They they you can like make a, make a good person evil, an evil person um, good, <laughs> um, and force you to actually reckon with long term consequences of your character. And they rack up all these emotional and physical scars, which is something I wish D and D did. D and D is very much a power fantasy, um, and that's fine. Uh, but I kind of, but I've noticed that you have to create your your personal wounds and flaws yourself out of or organically, where other systems ask you to keep track of that stuff. It's, uh, it's a whole. I'm fascinated with the idea of of interactive fiction, where where you have such total control over the character that you have to fill in that backstory and make sure they're dramatically interesting for everybody else at the table. This is so interesting. I never knew that you could actually have an arc or like character writing when playing Dungeons and Dragons. So I just wanted to ask uh, Jacob, like, how do you actually um, write that character as you're playing? I, uh, man, uh, like, you know, do, do I do I seem to, like write down dialogue in advance or anything like that? Yeah, like I mean, just like how do you keep track too of just the what your character goes through? Oh, I just, um, most of it's um, mental note. I mean, I, I don't write anything in advance um, because I try to, you know, let the story evolve where it goes. Uh, but, you know, I keep notes. I keep, you know, I, you, have a, you have a character sheet. We keep track of all the items and stats. So I flip it over and I, I write personal notes. Like I write down, whenever I design a character, and this is a something I borrowed from another game system, I, I believe the Burning Wheel, which is a very fantastic system. I write a series of uh, statements about my character. Um, stuff like... Um, I will never do this. I will always do this. This is the most important thing to me. And I try to, every time I, I, I approach a decision in a crossroads where one of those is challenged at this side, do I abide by this or, or does a fundamental aspect of, of my character change? And, I, and if it does, I make a note of it and I erase that line and write a new one. Mm -hmm. And I just keep you know notes of where I've been, where I'm going and what I believe in at that time. And by the time I finished with Bob Johnson, what he believed in had changed so fundamentally that he was a different person, and I realized I couldn't take him anymore. Like I couldn't take him further anymore. So I hope so they cool. answer, I hope they answer your question. Yeah, it did. I mean, it's just like it's something totally new and cool to me. Yeah, and HT, you're such a fan of like fantasy in Middle Earth. I'm surprised you've never gotten into like RPGs, which actually brings us to what you've been up to this weekend. Yeah. Speaking of Tolkien, because uh, Jacob made sure to name drop that while he was uh, describing Bob Johnson. Yes. Um, <laughs> I went to uh, see the Tolkien Maker of Middle Earth exhibit at the Morgan Library and Museum. So this is the uh, museum that was made from uh, J.P. Morgan's private uh, collection of art and books. And it's a pretty small museum in New York, but um, I found it pretty interesting just because of like how eclectic the collection was. Like, for example, he had at least two whole bookshelves worth worth of Robinson Crusoe, which I found hilarious. Um, I don't know how you why you need so many collections of, of Robinson Crusoe, but um, what we were really there for was the Token exhibit, which um, basically compiles all of Token's original illustrations, maps, draft manuscripts, and uh, kind of um, telegraphed his process in creating uh, the Hobbit and Lord of the Rings series and Middle Earth itself. And uh, it gave me a newfound appreciation for uh, J.R.R. Tolkien. I have, I've read all the books. I was, you know, a fan, uh, particularly of The Hobbit growing up. I read The Hobbit first and it was, um, I read it as a child. So it was definitely something that spoke to me a lot more than Lord of the Rings, which I read a few years later. I think I was still in elementary school and I thought it was fine, but a little tedious. Um, I remember there was like a whole section where he just talks about trees for like two pages. And I was like, what is this? But um, I haven't revisited Lord of the Rings since then. And I'm looking in, seeing this exhibit and seeing just like everything that went into it and all the influences that J.R. Tolkien brought into it uh, gave me a newfound appreciation, made me want to both revisit the Lord of the Rings trilogy and also um, read The Cimmerillion, which is something I've never done. Um, I have like this fascination with it now. But um, it goes back into like his family history, um, his um, the influences that his mother brought, uh, particularly her passion for handwriting and calligraphy, and uh, how, for example, the Finnish language was something that he found so beautiful that he decided to use that as like the base basis for Elvish. And um, he, how he wrote um, The Hobbit as like a story kind of for his children, and they were very upset when they found out that it was published, and they were like, it was like 
their bedtime story. Um, and oh, then, I've never heard that before. That's yeah, that's crazy. It's really fascinating. And um, they, uh, when his publisher asked for a sequel, he worked on Lord of the Rings for several years, and it was supposed to be more of a children's book, but ended up kind of becoming this whole new beast because of his experiences with like World War II, and um, it became something much more somber and and grandiose and uh it's just so it was just really fascinating to see how that came about and like not not only did they have like his plans but just like random doodles that he did for example on like crossword puzzles and uh that was considered part of like his whole uh writing process um one of my favorite things that i saw there actually was um he kept very extensive notes. He had this whole timeline of the Lord of the Rings trilogy and like how each of the groups of characters like went on their own separate journeys, like where they um, separated and everything. So he had the, the groups like uh, he even had the orcs and the ring wraiths and he had, you know, the, the men, their allies and Gandalf and the hobbits and how and he had them like kind of showing them how they crossed and um Disc and connected and um, separated and stuff. And it was really cool to see. Um, so, yeah, it's it's great. They didn't allow us to take pictures in it because um, uh, it was just like a very private collection of things. But I highly recommend uh, going to check it out. It was really cool. And um, they have some great uh, Lord of the Rings um merchandise in the store as well i bought myself a pocket hobbit and i was very excited about it, it has the well, wait the, what is a pocket hobbit oh just just the hobbit but like pocket sized edition oh so you can take so, it anywhere with you yeah exactly so i just i like pocket sized things um so and it has like the um the new anniversary cover of it too so um i was uh it was really cool and um i am I'm excited to kind of dive back into the series, maybe in time for the Amazon <laughs> series to uh, to show up and I can have the actual knowledge of it instead of just relying on my um, Lord of the Rings nerd friends. Yeah. Okay. Uh, speaking of reading, let's talk about what we've been reading. Chris, you've been reading a lot this week? Uh, yeah, I keep I keep trying to read a lot more, and every weekend I basically sit down and try and burn through some books. You, and you, you're uh, putting Jacob to shame. He tried to read one <laughs> one book a week, and you're like reading like three. Yeah, I'm I'm sure I'll drop off sooner or later. I, I'll get bored with it. But <laughs> for now, I uh, I read Dreyer's English by Benjamin Dreyer, and he's the the copy chief of Random House. And uh, this book is all about you know copy editing and style and grammar and punctuation, and you know that can be boring in theory, but this book is very entertaining, and I'm always looking to better myself as a writer and i just really enjoyed this book and uh you know i think if, if you if anyone out there uh likes to write or wants to write or considers themselves a writer they should probably pick this book up just because it, it's it's a good uh, uh crash course through things even if you know all the rules that are being talked about here it puts them in a new perspective so um i, I would highly recommend this book uh, I also read In the Blink of an Eye by Walter Murch, who is uh, an editor. He edited uh, The Conversation and Apocalypse Now and a bunch of other uh, Francis Ford Coppola movies. Um, and, you know, he's from an older school uh, style of editing. And um, this book was published uh, a little while ago. And it just basically, you know, it, it's all about editing film and, you know, why certain cuts work the way they do. And it was a really good book, but it also made me really depressed because it just points out how terrible film editing has become, where everything is like cut like super fast in this like chaotic way. And Walter Murch's whole thing is about you know longer takes and longer cuts, and uh, you know filmmakers just don't do that anymore. It's all about you know quick, quick, super fast ADD sort of <laughs> editing. And uh, you know I, I feel like we've we've lost something by embracing that but that's you know that's just the way it is now and i guess there's really no going back uh and finally i read i heard i finished i started reading this a while ago but i finished um i heard you paint houses by charles brand and this is the book that uh inspired um the irishman the new martin scorsese movie with robert de niro and al pacino and uh i'm sad to say i did not really like the book the book is um about this guy named frank sheeran 
who claims he was a, a uh, hitman for hire. And he also claims he's the guy who killed Jimmy Hoffa, the, the famous or infamous uh, teamster leader who disappeared years ago and they never found him. And uh, part of the problem I had with the book is it's very clearly, it's clear to me at least that this guy is just a hundred percent full of shit. Like no, nothing he says comes across as true to me. Like, cause not, it's almost like it's like a forest gump through the crime world. Cause not only does he, you know, claim that he killed Jimmy Hoffa, he also claims he was involved with like the Kennedy assassination and also Watergate and all it's, it just does not seem realistic to me. That said, I am still looking forward to the movie because I'm sure Martin Scorsese will take, you know, the best bits from the book and only use them and cut out all the other crap. So while I did not like the book, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the Irishman still. Jacob, how is your reading of one book a, a week journey been? Uh, terrible. I'm still reading uh, best movie year ever, which is actually a very light, easy, breezy, fun read. In fact, I haven't finished it. Speaks a lot to me doing other things. And but, putting but do, off do, reading. Do, do you think a book like that is easier to read like episodically? I feel like that's not something I would like, you know, binge my way through. I'd like want to read, you know, one of those, you know, one of the chapters like every like week or something. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I think it just depends on the book, honestly. And this one is very easy to read. Like I, I when I finish chapter, I want to start the next one. It, uh, it's very, very good. And also, I'll, I'll be honest with, uh, with you, Peter. Um, I used to do almost all of my reading in bars while while having a drink. I used to go, I would go to like a, my local haunt, Tr- uh, Trudy's uh, Mexican uh, restaurant in in Austin with a bar staff that knows me and my wife extremely well because um, we were there so often. And I would stay there for three hours, and I would um, eat chips and queso, I would drink tequila, and I would just finish entire books in one in a single sitting. But ever since I started dieting, and I have uh, cut down. Um, almost all alcohol, and I've stopped eating, you know, sugar, and I'm doing extreme low carb. My reading opportunities, <laughs> I feel like they've dried up, which is a really sad state of affairs. Uh, but that, that's the truth, and I, I'm trying to manufacture a new environment where I like reading because my favorite thing to do in the world is to have a a book I'm enjoying, uh, glass of alcohol, and basket of chips. It is my it is straight up my favorite thing I've ever done uh, for leisure time, and not having that anymore has been. <laughs> A serious uh, blow to my self esteem uh, when it Jacob, comes to reading. This is sad. Go to a coffee shop. Yeah. <laughs> That's a fun place to read. No, it's not. I don't like coffee. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, though, to be fair, I'm training myself to like coffee. Uh, this is so off subject. But I'm training myself to like iced coffee because uh, it goes down easier uh, and cold brew and all and all that stuff. I, during South by Southwest, I really dove into it to try to learn to like it. I'm drinking a cup of iced coffee every morning with my you know vitamins and brain medication and whatnot so i'm trying to learn to like it but i don't know i i just i i miss being able to associate books with enjoying delicious things <laughs> uh, i don't want to encourage you to eat sweets at a coffee shop because that's what i like to do <laughs> <laughs> but uh peter i have been reading my comics and i have opinions on the final issue of bprd uh, not a lot of people talk about this. I, I thought about writing an article for Slash Hill, and I may still do it this week. I just need to find the time. Um, because the Hellboy universe came to an end last week. With all the movies bombing in theaters, uh, the Hellboy universe is over. They'll still keep doing prequel comics set in the 50s and so on. Uh, but BPRD, uh, the, the spinoff series from Hellboy, uh, has been running for, goodness, over 150 issues uh, by the time this came out. Uh, it, it's gone. Um this series began when Hellboy left the BPRD, as seen in Hellboy 2, the, the, the movie version, and followed the supporting cast of the Hellboy comics as they were on their own adventures. And even though Mike Mignola, Hellboy's creator, is credited on every issue and apparently had a, had a hand in guiding the overall story, most of it was written by John Arcudi, uh, an incredibly talented comic writer and a rotating cast of incredible artists uh, who, who brought this grittier, more realistic style to the Hellboy universe. And... Arcudi left at uh, a little over a year ago, and uh, a new writer, Scott Alley, who's been a long-time editor on the Hellboy books, took over writing duties, and the series really started suffering. Uh, for whatever skills Alley has as an editor, uh, he doesn't have the same knack for dialogue characterization. So BPRD started going really downhill really fast, and I feel like the, I can't speak for the creators involved, I don't think they have about this, but the series came to its end, and I think it may have been because... Arcudi left, and the series simply was not the same series anymore. But 
Mignola had a big hand in the final issue, even drawing the last half of it, uh, which he hasn't done for BPRD in years. And I'll just say the Hellboy universe ends definitively. It's, it's not a good BP, BPRD ending. It does not do service to the characters. Uh, and since the series is with the apocalypse, most of the cast is wiped out. It is extremely dark. It is. It's where I expect Game of Thrones and like everybody's miserable. Uh, but as, as ending for the Hellboy universe, it actually ties back in so closely to the to the comic and to the lore and to things that are set up in the very first issue from 1994, 25 years ago. And as a final punctuation mark on um, this entire universe, this universe that is as complex as Marvel, as confusing as DC, uh, it requires you to really understand 25 years of history to fully appreciate it. It works as an ending for all of it. But as an ending for BPRD, it is such a letdown and i wish they had found a way to keep our cootie on so you could have finished these characters off in a strong way but yeah um bprd and hellboy comics really worth diving into but just be aware that the 15 issues before the final issue are a slog and i think everybody knows it (laughs) okay you mentioned game of thrones i think that segues quite nicely into what we've been watching Ben, what did you think of last night's episode without, I I guess, giving spoilers because some people have not watched it yet? So I'm sure a lot of people are kind of sick of me uh, not trash talking Game of Thrones, but but taking umbrage with some of the directions that it's gone and some of the increased scope and like the focus on the battle episodes and stuff like that over the past year or two. And this episode, wait a second, Ben, I've heard nothing but good things about the last night's episode. I have not watched it, but I've everybody's glowing, saying it might be one of the best episodes of the entire series. Are you trying to say that you did not like it? No, I'm actually saying that I loved it because it didn't do any of the things that I just mentioned. Like those the the complaints that I've had about the show and and the direction that it's taken over the past couple seasons, uh, it, it seems like this episode was written specifically for me, like somebody who doesn't really care about characters jumping on the back of dragons and flying around just because it's like supposed to be a fist pumping moment, but instead an episode that's almost entirely devoted to characters sitting around in a room and, uh, you know, hashing out their feelings and, and having uh, triumphant, uh, long deserved moments of recognition and, uh, just amazing character moments. It, it was so small scale and so, um, just an, an intimate episode. Uh, Jacob and I, in our in our joint review, we sort of referred to it as like Game of Thrones bottle episode, which is like the show is so big they've never really had the opportunity to do that before because the the scope of the whole thing has been so sprawling. But this is the first episode I think that's only taken place at one location in the entire history of the show. They they literally don't cut away from anywhere other than Winterfell in this episode, and I freaking loved it. And Jacob, I know you did too. Yeah, this is one of the best episodes of Game of Thrones they've ever done. And not a single death, not a single fight. Just characters we love waiting through the, the longest night imaginable. They're waiting for an army to arrive. They're, they're all aware they're probably going to lose this fight. And we're watching characters we spent eight years with choose how to spend their final hours, who they spend them with, and what they want to do, and what they want to talk about. And... These characters all come from you know across the continent. They've all been through so many different experiences. Some of them hate each other. Some of them love each other. Some of them have such mixed feelings. Look at you, Arya and the Hound. Uh, but seeing how what they choose to do with their final hours is profoundly moving and very funny. Uh, there's there's a group of characters who gather around a fire in a, in a circle of chairs, drinking wine. There's a group of people who have no reason to be in the same room. They're all they've all gathered here by fate, but. It would have been unimaginable these people be in the same castle, let alone the same room, you know, a couple years ago. And it's the funniest, sweetest, strangest conversation all of Game of Thrones. It's a good, it's a really large chunk of the episode. And it, 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 it we went back and redid our lists from earlier this month, Ben, of best moments and best episodes. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. I think the whole drinking circle and this episode would make both lists. Yeah, I think so too. And and just really quickly, I know we're we're going along on this, but I think it's so important to me for this episode to exist where it does at this point in the season because even if all there's only four episodes of the show left by the way. So even if all four episodes, even if it's all stuff that I have have been complaining about for the past, you know, a couple years, uh it will 
it, it will go down so much easier because of the setup and the groundwork that they laid in this episode and the fact that they took the time in the final season of the show to have two setup episodes before the the full war is unleashed. Um, it, it just means a lot to me uh, on a on a storytelling level and on a personal level because it just seems like they they really cared and it shows me that the showrunners. Um, you know, they they care about these characters as much as, uh, you know, way more than I do. And, and it, it, that is something that sometimes get, has gotten lost for me in some of my complaints over the past couple of years, but watching an episode like this, where it's so small and, and so focused, um, just sort of reinvigorates my love for the show. Very cool. Um, okay. I will talk about what I've been watching this week. I, Watched the first couple episodes of Bosch season five. I feel like this is a show that I know none of you have watched the show. Uh, ben, I actually think you would enjoy the show because I know you're into mysteries and this is kind of a serialized, uh, you know, detective, hard boiled detective show that takes place in Los Angeles. I, I feel like a lot of people write off the show as just like, you know, it's one of those things their dad would watch. Um, but it's so much better than that. Um, and this season, Starts off with, uh, I mean, usually this show is a little bit slow going. It's kind of, um, I mean, it's based on the series of novels about this character uh, named Bosch, who is a detective for the Los Angeles uh, PD. And he, uh, he usually kind of takes a, I, I would I would like to think it takes a more realistic approach to the crime investigation process. And like each season is usually about like one kind of case and it, you know, takes its time. In the opening of this season five premiere, there's just so much explosiveness. Uh, there's you know murder. There's explosions. There's robbery. I don't know. There's just so much packed into that first episode, and I we've only gotten two episodes in, but I really like this series, and I I do want to recommend it because I know everybody out there probably has Amazon Prime, and this is something you get obviously with it with the Amazon Prime Video. And uh, Bosch is a really enjoyable series. And I think for those of you who don't like serialized TV because it just feels like they're making stuff up as they go along, this is, you know, inspired by a book. So I feel like it has more of a overall arc to each season that feels like it was written by, like, one author. Um, so, yeah. Bosch. How consistent is the show, Peter? I know this this is the fifth season, so you're in a point with the show now where yeah. you can make the judgments of like, okay, this season is better than the others. How how is it how has it been overall? Oh, I don't know. That that's a hard one. Each season is so very different. It's it's like I don't know. It, it, that's a hard. Uh, it, ben, I, watch Bosch season one. I, just give it a try. <laughs> I, like I'm not gonna say it's like it's anything to like. Be like this is the best thing ever, and I feel like I know nowadays with so much content, and so many streaming services, like for something to be worth your time, it has to be amazing. So th this is an amazing, but it's very good, and it's it's enjoyable, and it's something. I don't know. I, I just feel like you would be into it because of the the mystery aspect, and it also um, has like an overarching like there's, you know, a history with him and his mo mother. Something happened to his mother, and like that goes for multiple seasons so like it it's not just the you know the case of the week that is you know that season there's like more to bite into there okay you can you've convinced me i'll give it a shot and um last week i mentioned uh watching dark side of the ring this is the show on viceland from director jason eisner who did uh hobo with the shotgun and revenge uh and i've been continuing to watch that this week they had the bret hart montreal screwjob episode which i also mentioned last week that i watched uh hitman heart wrestling with shadows and this episode is a good companion to that it features uh a bunch of stuff that isn't in that documentary it it, it kind of um gives you some perspective of the legacy of this and give, it gives you some people that were involved actually talking about it and some some actually arguing who was responsible for it and uh, I know Jacob. After I recommended this on last week's episode, the uh, Hitman Heart Rest Wrestling with Shadows documentary, you actually went and watched it. Yeah, he said the uh, director uh, Paul J has it up on his YouTube channel, so you can go watch it on YouTube right now. And it's like I said, I don't watch wrestling, but I have so many friends who do who keep me apprised of all the wackiest updates on it because I find it as an industry and a business 
so singular and fascinating. And some of the smartest people I know write brilliantly about wrestling. And, it, and I think it's amazing that, that it can inspire the most lowbrow reactions and the most highbrow reactions from people from all different walks of life and background. It's a documentary. I don't think you need to be a wrestling fan to enjoy it. Uh, as Peter mentioned, it's about uh, essentially a Bret Hart's final year in the WWF before he was transitioning to WCW. And it follows him and his family as as his life puts him into a place where he's his heroic character turned into a villain and he grapples grapples with you know with, with that in a way it's surprisingly moving because he can, because he's it's almost like saying the character you've built and played and you hold as a core part of you uh, has to now get booed instead of cheered and it's just really fascinating to see that actually happen you know and have the emotional toll on the performer and of course it all leads to the infamous Montreal screw job which you know it, it has a Wikipedia page that's almost the length of a book because that's how complex it gets and I just found this to be such an intimate personal and damning documentary the footage is amazing the filmmaking itself isn't always it, it's a very very low budget affair it, it's Cana- it can like a low budget canadian indie documentary from the from the late 90s it doesn't have any polish to it but but it's, it was like they were incredible. in they were in the right place at the right yes. time to capture like an explosion that no one could have predicted yeah and if you are even remotely interested in like what goes into making wrestling happen. Uh, even if you have no interest in actually watching it, if you want to know what these, what these people are like, what the industry is like, you know, what goes on behind the scenes of this, this documentary is really a must see. I was kind of blown away by it. Yeah. Uh, what else have you been watching this week, Jacob? Uh, speaking of documentaries that have no right to be as open and honest and forthright as they are. I watched the new Netflix documentary series, uh, formula one drive to survive. And like with wrestling, uh, Peter, I have I don't watch Formula One. I have never watched a Formula One race. Uh, but by the end of this series, my wife and I were like, we need to start watching Formula One. We were so on board with everything this series was uh, offering. It is actually a production from Formula One, but it is not a, a, a hagiography where it's just trying to paint this glowing portrait of of this, of this racing sport. It is the equivalent of if the NFL personally hired cameramen to go into the locker rooms of every single NFL team, filmed every argument, every disagreement, every shoving match, and everybody be brutally honest with each other, and then said, yeah, cut it together and don't change anything. That's what's Because it's Formula Formula 1 is a much smaller sport than the NFL. It's only 10 teams and 20 racers. But it is one of the most uh, well-edited well presented, well shot, and brutally honest sports documentaries I've ever seen. All ten episodes are about a half hour long. Some are a little longer, and it is just gripping and funny. And I was just thrilled by every episode. And so many of the so many great storylines emerge from unexpected places. The structure of the show, the way it jumps around time, uh, is quietly like really really powerful in how it builds to certain things. And like there's actually a Formula One track uh, built in Austin. It's, you know, about a 30 minute drive from where I live. And at the time when it was built, I was like, oh, I have zero interest in that. But now I'm like literally looking into how can I go watch a Formula One race when it comes to Texas next year for the American um, leg, leg of, the, of the world tour. Because I, I am so interested in the racers, their cars, the behind the scenes politics, the, the idea that you have to balance the idea of you can be a brilliant driver, but do you, you don't have the budget of, of another team. So some, some mediocre racers are driving cars that are as powerful as a space shuttle, or some of the best drivers are, are like driving cars that are barely being held together because they don't have the money to keep them running. It's just, I was, I was straight up enthralled by this documentary. Has anybody else watch this? Cause if not, you have to watch this. <laughs> no, but it sounds a lot. It sounds like you're going to really love the new uh, Ford versus Ferrari movie that comes out later this year. Yeah. It yes. sort of sounds like it has that same sort of vibe to it. I am totally up for that because Ferrari is still dominating right now. They're, they're like one of the big teams and one of the very few not to be highlighted in the documentary. Apparently uh, Ferrari and uh, Mercedes uh, both turned down the opportunity to be featured in the doc where all the other teams are. And um, it's, Man, this and like I want to go back and re- rewatch Rush, the Ron Howard Formula One movie now, and I want to watch. I still haven't seen Senna, the documentary about the legendary Formula One racer who died in the '80s. So now it's on Netflix. I go watch that now. I feel like yeah. Formula One could be a thing that I'm genuinely interested in. There's enough drama here to fill, 
you know, it, the still Game of Thrones absence, I'm going to go watch Formula One so I can watch <laughs> Europeans murder each other in different ways by winning in races. <laughs> Jacob, one of the things I love about you is, you know, you aren't necessarily a sports fan, but you're into like all these athletic competitions purely because you are interested in the human story behind them and yeah. not actually because of the competition itself. All wrapped all together for you, Peter. I love RPGs because you create a story in the moment. Sports is the same thing. Sports is a drama being told in real time that's not being pre-written or preordained. It is it is entirely it is the purest form of storytelling because because it, it is humans writing their own stories and whether they're heroes, cowards, or villains is something that happens in the moment. And that is amazing. That is genuinely incredible. Uh, I, I'm a casual sports fan, as you said, Peter, but I will watch any 30 for 30. <laughs> I will watch any good sports doc. I am obsessed with the idea of storytelling happening organically. Very cool. Uh, did you watch anything else this week? Oh, uh, I watched the silence. It is terrible. It is a Netflix horror movie. Uh, it's, it's, even though it's based on a novel of the same name, it really is essentially uh, a quiet place all over again, where uh, creatures um, are on Earth, are found on Earth that are blind but respond to sounds. People live very quietly to survive in the post-apocalypse, and one, the family at the heart, in front of it, even has a deaf daughter who to so all know how to sign. And it's literally a quiet place. It has all the exact same plot details except the monsters are, are have wings that's pretty much the only difference and it's a rough rough watch uh Kieran and shipka from the black coat's daughter and mad men is the lead and we got the conversation but whether or not a uh a non-deaf actress should be playing a deaf character uh but here like look at a quiet place where the actress playing the daughter actually is deaf and it lends so much nuance to the performance whereas Kieran and shipka I never believed she was deaf this entire movie. It, it is a bad performance from an actress I genuinely like, and there's no reality to her to, to, to her disability, and I didn't buy it at all. Even Stanley Tucci, who plays her father, is, it, the, the Tooch, my man, the Tooch, is in this movie, and he's not elevating in any way, even though he's trying. He's trying his best. Stanley Tucci can't give a bad performance you know, at all. Uh, but any horror movie starring Stanley Tucci and Kieran Shipka should be good. And this thing is just absolute junk. It looks cheap. It feels cut to the bone. It's the kind of thing that, you know, of course Netflix bought this because the studio clearly looked at this and said, oh, we can't release this dog crap. Um, it is directed by uh, John R. Leonetti, who directed the very bad but still enjoyable Wish Upon from 2017. Uh, the first Annabelle, the, the, a.k.a. the Annabelle everybody does not like, um, even though I am a weird defender of it. And uh, Mortal Kombat Annihilation. Uh, so maybe it's not surprising the silence is no good whatsoever, but Netflix is pushing it hard. It's all over their front page. And if you saw Stanley Tucci and said, I want to watch it because that's Stanley Tucci, and he's one of the best actors alive today, don't fall for it. They're tricking you. <laughs> okay, it seems like uh, everybody on this podcast is making their way through Police Story. I think Ben was the first to watch it, then HT, and now, Chris, you watched this movie? Uh, yeah, it's coming out on the Criterion Collection next week, and they sent me a review copy of it. And uh, it, it, they, it, the the Criterion version has Police Story 1 and Police Story 2. And I haven't watched the second one yet, but I watched the first one over the weekend. And, yeah, just to uh, mirror what has already been said on this podcast in the past, it, it does indeed rule. It's just, it's, uh, you know, Jackie Chan defying all laws of gravity and physics and uh, all sorts of things and just... You know, throwing himself literally into all these action scenes, which, you know, it, it, they seem like they would kill anyone else. And it's not just Jackie Chan. It's like his whole team that he has of, you know, stuntmen and martial artists just doing this, these incredibly dangerous stunts. And uh, it's all real. You know, it's it's all practical. It's people really doing this stuff. And it's just a, it's just a lot of fun to watch. And one of the things I love about it is there's almost like no setup. The movie literally just starts and it's just like they give you a quick rundown of the cops looking at like a slideshow of the villains. And it just launches into the movie where it's just, you know, Jackie Chan and his his fellow cops just engaging in this very lengthy, crazy chase scene. And. You know, it's been said before, but, you know, Jackie Chan is basically like the Buster Keaton of action movies where he brings this this surprisingly comedic element to everything where, you know, it, yes, it's cool and it's action packed and it's dangerous, but he plays up, you know, the humor in it. Jackie Chan never really plays cool characters. He always plays sort of like 
nerdy dorks who just happen to be really good at fighting people. And it's just a, a, a joy to watch. And I can't wait, wait to watch the second one. Very cool. Ben, what have you been watching? Uh, so I watched uh, Homecoming, a not the Amazon show, but the film by Beyonce that is on Netflix right now. It's a concert movie uh, about last year's Coachella performance where she headlined. She was the first black woman to, uh, to headline Coachella ever. And uh, this concert film is pretty amazing. I mean, it it's true. Uh, I would say made up. It's, it's like uh, 90 percent of the actual performance footage and all of that and maybe 10 percent or maybe 15 percent of like a behind the scenes of like how it all came together and her working with her team and you know Beyonce is, has become such a um almost like an impenetrable uh figure who you know she's this pop culture icon this queen who's like untouchable in this ivory tower that like you know everybody just sort of um bows at her feet like rightfully because she's an incredible musician and performer but she's sort of like really difficult to access as a person like you know she doesn't really do that much press and there's you don't really get us a, a good sense of who she is other than what she's done you know sort of on her instagram and like maybe on stage like you sort of get a sense of this person but having this footage sort of interspliced with uh the concert stuff gives you a a good idea of like why she has become the icon that she is and it's this incredible work work ethic that she has and yes she directed the movie and and sort of wrote it and and like put this whole thing together so it is sort of a testament to her own <laughs> um amazing legend in a way but uh because it's so rare to get that glimpse at the real Beyonce, uh, I would say it's worth watching. And and the performance itself is is really incredible as well. I mean, it's like, I think it's over, how long is this movie? It's 137 minutes. And most of it is her performing on stage with like, I think she says at one point, there are 200 people on stage with her. Um, she brings out a ton of uh performers and and uh drum lines and dancers and all of this stuff and it's all on stage it's it's something that you wouldn't see in a traditional festival environment but she just like amps everything up and she doesn't stop moving for like the whole time so it's just it's an incredible like piece of uh endurance as well so um yeah it's on netflix right now it's called homecoming i don't know if anybody else has had a chance to check this out or is in or is interested in any way any of you guys uh planning on watching this i need to i haven't yet but i've heard really great things and i do love beyonce so yeah, I think I want to do a double feature of this in, in the Springsteen uh, doc with, with my wife because uh, I'm a huge Springsteen fan. She's a huge Beyonce fan. I think we should both make each other watch the other one at the same time. Yeah, that sounds like a good call. Um, I also watched The Secret Garden from 1949. Uh, Peter, when you and I were at CinemaCon, they showed a trailer for a new version of The Secret Garden that's coming out, I think, later this year. Um, and I had not seen this 1949 version. I think I saw the 90s one when I was very, very young and don't remember really anything about it so this uh, 1949 version which is directed by uh, Fred M. Wilcox and stars Margaret O'Brien uh, was on uh, um, Turner Classic Movies and I DVR'd it and just watched this because it's not that long it's like an 89 minute movie and I just wanted to sort of get you know re-familiarize myself with that story um, I I've been debating all week about whether or not to reveal this but I'm just going to anyway, because this movie's from 1949. I'm guessing most of our listeners probably aren't going to rewatch it, even if I say it's a good movie and you should watch it. Wait, um, wait, wait a second. So spoilers yeah, for a yeah, 1949 spoilers. movie. Yes. <laughs> uh, for a story that's been told several times. But this particular version is uh, is filmed in black and white. And then when the characters actually enter the titular secret garden it goes to color and i didn't realize that that was a thing that was going to happen uh this is an mgm movie and um it, you know it, it was it's like a big uh showcase of their technicolor technology i mean it's very wizard of oz it came out 10 years after wizard of oz um but i just had no idea that that was going to happen and but the the uh duality there the juxtaposition of the black and white and the color really really works for this story because the secret garden is supposed to be this sort of um not quite magical but place that represents a purity and a a, a different time for all of these characters and uh a a more um 
uh, pure past, I guess. Um, mm. But yeah, it, it's uh, it, I, I, you know, the, some of the performances are a little goofy, uh, <laughs> but the the story is solid, and I'm looking forward to actually revisiting the '90s version and then watching the new version and sort of seeing how they all compare across the timeline. But has anybody else ever seen this '49 version of this movie? You think I would, but I haven't, and I'm really intrigued by the color decision. I didn't know that that was the case either. Um, I watched the '90s version several times. You might know I'm a Francis Francis Hodgins Hodgson Burnett fan. I had her books, Little Princess and Secret Garden, growing up. I even had a pop up book of the Secret Garden, so I was a big fan of the story. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, I want to check this out now. I had no idea. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a great, um, it's a great story. It's very timeless. And I actually didn't know that there was going to be a new version either. So I am excited. Oh yeah. Get hey, ben, if, if, if you, if you want to, um, see more films from the era that experiment with color, like you're talking about, I will recommend my second favorite film of all time, a matter of life and death, uh, by Michael Powell and Emmerich Pressburger, which, uh, is set in during world war two on, on the ground and in the afterlife. And the afterlife is shot in black and white, while uh, the real world is shot in color. But they use um, they use technicolor film to, to shoot the black and white scenes, but didn't add color, which gives this really strange hmm. glow to the to all the black and white scenes. And there's all these stuff that was crazy for the time, like cross dissolve, supreme color on black and white scenes. And so, if this in any way interests you as like a way to uh, experience experiment with looking at ways people were using this these techniques in the 40s you should really watch it because it's also great yeah i do need to watch that I, I i've only seen i think the red shoes might be the only powell and pressburger movie i've ever seen i need to i need to remedy that immediately um all right so next up i watched the big heat on the criterion channel i, I subscribed to this after uh you know hearing uh, so many good things about it from the people who um you know were were big filmstruck advocates and this was the first movie that i watched on the uh the new streaming service this is a 1953 film noir movie directed by Fritz Lang, who did movies like uh, M and uh, Metropolis. And this one stars Glenn Ford, who I primarily knew from, he, he was in the original 310 to Yuma, but I, I mostly knew him as uh, Pa Kent in the uh, Superman movie from 1978, Richard Donner's Superman. Um, and I don't think I'd really seen much of him as like a Hollywood leading man, but this, you know, he, he plays a detective who is uh, investigating the suicide of one of his fellow police officers and he comes across a lot of dirty characters and and you know discovers all this corruption uh lee marvin plays like a, a heavy villain like a, a second in command type of guy and uh gloria graham is like his uh is lee marvin's character's girlfriend who's like this sort of femme fatale ish figure um this movie is really nasty there's like a lot of violence in it and and you know it seems shocking to watch even today so i'm i'm not sure how audiences reacted in 1953 when this came out but there's some pretty brutal stuff in there like there's a scene where lee marvin throws a a mug of or not, not even a mug like he he's holding a uh coffee uh, what are they called uh not a not a mug the thing that you make coffee in i'm a uh the like word coffee pot. Yeah, coffee pot. I guess. Yeah. I'm, I can you tell I don't drink coffee. But anyway, uh, he like hurls uh, boiling coffee on Gloria Graham's face and scars her face, and she screams for like minutes on end. Like this movie is pretty brutal. Um, so I, I would recommend it though. I mean, I think it's it's a solid, especially if you're interested in film noir, especially if you're interested in the movies of Fritz Lang, and and you know if you have the Criterion Collection. Uh, if you subscribe to that, this is a pretty, I mean, it's it's not an easy watch because it's sort of unsettling with all that violence, but the performances are really solid and um, it gave me a new appreciation for Glenn Ford and a guy who I, I primarily knew from a bunch of other types of stuff. Um, speaking of the Criterion Collection, I also, or the, the channel, I also watched Detour, which is the movie that Chris talked about last week. After hearing his description of the quasi insane plot of that movie i had to see this thing for myself and uh it is indeed very ridiculous and very fun i enjoyed it a lot it's the type of movie where somebody when talking about the uh the death penalty like the, the gas chamber somebody says i'd hate to see a guy as young as you sniffing the perfume that arizona hands out to free to murderers <laughs> it's like that's <laughs> such a long way to go to say i hope you don't got, die in a gas chamber um pedestrians are like walking through fog that's so thick you can barely see them in this movie the dialogue is is very really like 
you know, rat-a-tat and kind of crazy. Um, but Edgar G. Elmer directed this, and I feel like he he did a really, really good job with, you know, this was like a, a pretty low-budget uh, movie. It had the the budget... Uh, dis- it's disputed how much it cost to make somewhere between twenty thousand and a hundred thousand dollars, but for that level of money, especially, um, they really st- were able to stretch the dollar and make something that's really atmospheric and and a lot of fun to watch. Um, and Savage, I want to give a shout out to her. She plays the the uh, woman who ends up sort of blackmailing the lead guy after he makes so many boneheaded mistakes in this movie, uh, one after the other. But she has these really fiery eyes that were like, man, I, I totally bought her in this lead role in this performance. So uh, shout out to Anne Savage, who was in this 1945 film that <laughs> probably not that many people have seen. But anyway, uh, Detour, that one, as Chris mentioned last week, is also available uh, in the public domain right now. So you don't even have to have the Criterion channel to watch it. Um, and then finally, I, I rewatched Avengers Infinity War in preparation for Endgame. Um, Peter, I think you're going to the uh, premiere tonight. Is that right? Yeah, the premiere starts at 6 p.m. on the dot because this movie is long, long, long. So yes. if, if you look up on uh, the site and on my Twitter, probably around 9.30 or 10 p.m. tonight, you should see the first reactions from, uh, from uh, Avengers Endgame. And, of course, no spoilers, so just yes. you know, a reaction. All right, so you're seeing it tonight. I, my screening is tomorrow, um, so I just wanted to rewatch Infinity War. I'm not doing anything close to what Jacob and Brad have done recently, like diving you know, further back into the MCU and sort of building up to it. I just really wanted to watch the most recent thing again. And I have to say, I know Chris doesn't really like this movie, but I remember liking it at the time and, and thinking that there was a lot to like about it and really not appreciating the Battle of Wakanda stuff at the end and, and feeling like that sort of brought the movie down for me. But on rewatch, I like it even more this time. And I'm sort of surprised to come to that uh, revelation for myself. Like, I, it doesn't seem like the type of movie that I would like more on, uh, you know, third viewing or whatever it is. But uh, I have to say, I think the action scenes for in movies like these almost across the board are becoming less and less interesting to me, but the smaller character moments, and this is something that I guess you would, you know, if you read my Game of Thrones coverage, you probably picked up on this already. Um, the character moments are the things that really do it for me. And I feel like the script in Infinity War is pretty well executed, like pretty tight. You know, there's, there's not a lot of fat on there. And even though it's a long movie, it feels like most of those interactions are earned and or really funny and or just uh, surprising in all of the right ways. So um, I have a new appreciation for Avengers Infinity War after rewatching it, and I'm sure Peter is probably ha- happy to hear that. <laughs> yeah, I rewatched this a couple weeks back. I think I mentioned it on the podcast, and I had the same reaction about the Wakanda stuff. Like, I feel like when I saw that theatrically, I it, that kind of brought the movie down. Like, maybe I'm wondering if it's expectations. Like, maybe. Because we didn't know, we, we expected that to be a bigger, like, th- like more intense fight scene. Like, that was, the trailers were kind of building up to that being the, you know, the penultimate moment in that movie. And obviously that, you know, kind of was, but wasn't. Uh, actually, very interestingly, I have an interview going up with Russo Brothers. It's going to be on the site tomorrow. And it's completely spoiler free because they will not talk about any of the plot or Endgame, but it, I, one thing we brought up in the chat is that this new movie, I think this might be the first blockbuster in the history of, or at least modern history of blockbusters, that we have not seen one lick of an action scene. They are not even, they are not advertising a third tier tentpole action scene in this movie. We mm. We have no idea what any of the action scenes in this movie look like, and that's pretty insane. Yeah. And, uh, you know, even watching the Wakanda stuff, like I still wasn't crazy about it because it's the same thing. You know, the same complaints hold true about it being like a faceless horde and you don't really care about any of those characters. And it all, you know, just sort of gets too big for its own good. But uh, as somebody who's just coming to terms with the fact that I have to put a lot of the modern action stuff aside and, uh, you know, especially when thinking about coming from something like police story, like you know, mixing those types of movies into my rotation as a cinephile, it's like you really come to appreciate 
the you know the yeah. the more uh, practical tactile kind of stuff versus these huge like bigger than their own good uh, digital stuff. But um, but like I said, the the dialogue and and a lot of the character interactions are so good in Infinity War. They're better than I remember. So uh, I wanted to give it a, a quick shout out for that. Yeah, we we need to talk Chris into giving another shot. No, uh, <laughs> yeah, I am I, seeing I am seeing Endgame tomorrow though. So and I'll I'll be doing the review for the site, which I'm sure. A million listeners just groaned inwardly hearing that news. I'm so I pro- excited to read your review, Chris. I promise to give it a fair shake. I've said this before, but I never go into a movie hoping to hate it. And I want this to be good, so fingers crossed. And Brad will be doing a spoiler review, so we'll be having, we'll be having all kinds of perspectives on this film in the, in the days ahead for sure. Yeah, and we'll also have some spoiler coverage on this podcast as well. Um, okay, finally, HT, what have you been watching this week? Not that much, except for the Noah Centenego Gigolo movie, <laughs> The Perfect Date, which is not that perfect of a movie. In fact, it's just all right. Um, it's not as terrible as uh, Centineo's last go around in Netflix, which was Sierra Burgess is a Loser, uh, which is uh, that was a pretty terrible film, which had very misguided themes. The Perfect Date, uh, meanwhile, just kind of feels very much like a product of the Netflix algorithm. And even Noah Centineo's inherent charisma can't really keep this from being more interesting than it is not. (laughs) Um, It follows a um, a high school student who has uh, no defining features about him except for straight A's and who really wants to go to Yale for some reason uh, as he decides to offer his services as a fake dating escort uh, to make money for college but then of course he falls in love um it's yeah it's just a fine okay movie um the one thing that is interesting about it is that noah centineo plays a character named brooks radigan and uh he pulls it off so that's one thing i'll have i'll say it go is going for it is he but as yeah, charismatic it, in this movie as he was in uh, to all the boys i loved before no, it's unfortunate because like he's kind of doing the same thing, but it feels like Netflix is really bringing him dry. And uh, I'm I'm looking forward to when he's back in the To All the Boys I Love Before uh, series and just bouncing off of Lana Condor, who is much better um, sort of foil for him than like all of his other uh, love romantic interests have been so thus far in Netflix films. Gotcha. Very cool. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to what we've been eating. Uh, I can officially announce that I have lost officially 50 pounds, so I'm halfway towards my goal, which is very exciting. Uh, awesome, Peter. Congratulations. Beer, 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 beer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> what was that? I don't it even know. It was the crowd going wild. It was the crowd. Yeah, yeah, you know. Well, thank you. I have, <laughs> I appreciate it. I have a big smile across my face that you can't see right now because we're not in the same room. But – um, I do want to recommend some food this week. I uh, got this new low carb cereal called Magic Spoon, which is super expensive. It comes in like a box, and not like pouches like uh, cereal school. But this tastes, uh, I want to say, like 10 times better. So I would highly recommend it. They have four different kinds they have like a fruity, they have a frosted, they have a cinnamon, and then a cocoa. And the fruity is the best flavor. But Jacob, you need to try this. Um, it's called Magic Spoon. I highly recommend it. Yeah, I Googled it when I saw it on the dock. And uh, I, n- next month, when we refresh our groceries, I'm, yeah. I'm probably going to buy some of this. I, I will say it's kind of bullshit because it's so expensive that, like, they argue, like, on their, like, Instagram page, they're, they're like, per serving of this is the cost of what you normally pay for a protein bar. And it's like, but that's not how much you usually pay for a serving of cereal. Not at all. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. But it might be worth it if you're in the mood for cereal. Um, also, when I was at Disney California Adventure th- this weekend doing the vlogging, uh, I did uh, I did cheat. I did end up trying the ghost pepper mac and cheese at the Food and Wine Festival because I, that's something I wanted to try last time and I didn't get to try it. And uh, if you like spicy, if you like mac and cheese, and if you're going to be in Disney California Adventure before the end of Food and Wine, I highly rec- recommend this. This is probably one of the best things I've ever had at Food and Wine. In it, uh, how get- how intense is the ghost pepper? Because isn't that one of the most spicy um, peppers in the world? Well, yes, but I I feel like it's not like they probably only put a little of it in. The, like this is a theme park crowd, so they're not going to mm. like. 
this is not like some you know like there's places in LA that you can go like in you know uh tide town and you know go to like this place that looks like a back room and then get a dish that will like set your mouth on fire for a week and i, I it's not that hot um i'm assuming they don't use that much of the ghost pepper because then they'd be getting complaints from you know people that are from middle america and not used to spices but i will say it is probably the spiciest thing i've ever had in a theme park um and my mouth was kind of uh on fire for the rest of the night it was uh very enjoyable um i've never really had i think i've had some buffalo wild wings has a wing called blazing which i think has some ghost peppers in it and i've had this those are the only two uh dips of the toe i have gone into ghost pepper have anybody else here tried anything ghost pepper i have on several occasions i really love the flavor i, I love the, i love the heat and it definitely can be overwhelming so you gotta be careful with it but like for, for example um i think the best use of I've ever tasted was there's a local taco uh chain in austin called torchy's tacos it's delicious and that place is amazing yeah and they have a taco of the month uh, every month where they have a specialty thing at, at limited time and one time they had a um, a ghost pepper taco that came with a, um, a a ranch sauce that was infused with ghost pepper. So it was like this extremely sweet and spicy sauce. And for the entire month, I'd go there and I, I whatever taco I would get, I would also ask for a side of the ghost pepper sauce. And I just had it virtually a couple times a week because I loved it so much. And I wish you'd bring it back because it was amazing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's move on to what we've been playing uh, something I wanted to plug is I last night recorded the Summer Movie Wager episode of the Slash Filmcast, and you should be able to hear that right now on the Slash Filmcast uh, feed, and it'll be on the site uh, probably tomorrow. Um, and this is the yearly game where we try to predict the su- you know the top ten movies at the summer box office, which uh, is starting with Disney's uh, Avengers Endgame. Uh, last year we did uh, a version with the Slash Film staff. Uh, uh, do, do do we want to do that again this year? Yeah. I'm down for it. Let's do it. Yeah. I lost horribly, I think, but I'm excited about this. <laughs> well, there, there's no real good method to this. Like, I feel like it's all a crapshoot, but it's it, it's a fun crapshoot. And you can actually uh, participate in the Summer Movie Wager if you want to. I think it's thesummermoviewager.com. You can actually enter in your top ten and compete against us and compete against globally everybody playing last year there was thousands of people playing so uh check that out at the summer movie com. and uh it sounds like we'll probably do a podcast later this week because we've got to do it before you know end game comes out because there's no no knowing you know the uh the box office uh even the early you know uh, night before box office totals and, and being not that anybody isn't going to put avengers end game as their number one but just you know Yes. Okay, uh, Jacob, what have you been playing? In a, a bit of a miracle, uh, the game Cuphead has been ported to the Switch, uh, where there's no neurals but downgrades. And before I go any further, has anybody here seen footage from Cuphead or played it before? I have seen footage, and I've heard this game is incredibly difficult. Has Have you found that to be true so far? Uh, yeah, I played it uh, when I initially hit the PC in 2017, but I never beat it. And now the Switch, it's perfect. Uh, it's a perfect Switch game because... Uh, you can play it for two minutes at a time and, and be fine and, and put it down and come back to it. Um, I'm going to do what I'm going to do first before I forget. I'm going to drop a YouTube link to this game's initial launch trailer in the show notes. Because you have not seen footage from Cuphead. Uh, I really think you guys should watch it. This is this game um, where so many game developers strive you know, for realistic graphics or graphics that, you know, have all the detail you could possibly want to, to be photorealistic. Cuphead uses the same power of modern game design and graphical uh, interfaces and all that to create a game that looks like a 1930s cartoon, complete with all the film scratches and audio hiccups. It's uh, It looks so much like the source material that my jaw just drops when I look at it. And it goes beyond the graphics, goes into the music and the voice acting and the sound effects. And... And like a lot of those old cartoons, it's sort of a morality play uh, setup that's also creepy and unusual and feels very wrong at times. It, it, it manages to blend like the flights of fancy of early Disney with the genuine creepiness of like Max Fleischer cartoons from that era. And the gist is you're playing as Cuphead, who is this sort of guy who's literally um, a, 
Mickey Mouse esque character shape, but his head's a cup. And his brother Mugman, uh, you, you play with two players. Uh, both um, go to a casino where they smoke uh, cigars and gamble and go too far because they accidentally lose their souls to the devil who owns the casino, and they are sent out to uh, on a mission to um, save their souls, which involves this trip through this, through various cartoon levels, fighting all kinds of cartoon bosses. And it all looks so amazing. Uh, it, it has been uh, pointed out, it is famously hard. It is very difficult. It's not something you play casually or lightly. Uh, but I, I have noticed it's also the kind of game where if you actively pay attention to the screen, you watch what you're doing, and you like actively work to get better at it, it uh, really does reward you and teach you how to play it. Um and I know, like, there's always like uh, this mentality with gamers, like you gotta get good if you want to get good at a game, and they always say it, like this in a snob way. But I think Cuphead uh, kind of lures you with his visuals, and then like offers a genuine challenge, but in a way where it asks you to um, take note of all the detail in the animation and take note of um, how nothing is on that screen for an accident, and while it looks very pretty. Uh, the fact that it uses this animation to really draw your eye where you need to be looking to, you know, survive the game. And as somebody who likes challenging games, likes old cartoons, and likes the idea that somebody um, managed to make an incredibly challenging, worthwhile, fun game that so perfectly emulates the look, style, and feel of, of old cartoons, uh, it is... It's such an achievement. It, it is, well, it, I would show people... I show people this game all the time just to say, like, look what games can do now. In fact, it plays on a Switch, which you know is the least powerful main console, and without losing a beat, uh, man, I'm I'm so excited. I'm, I'm playing this game pretty much constantly these days. Is uh, I'm wondering, Jacob, is there a video game? You were talking earlier about the RPG and having to completely, you know, create a new character. Is there a video game that not just after like the first like you know half an hour, but like significantly far into it, the player that you're playing dies, and you actually have to play like a new character? The answer is yes, but I don't want to spoil which <laughs> oh, game okay. it is, yes. because it's actually a pretty major game that is still being widely played. Okay, that, that's that interesting. happens in a Kingdom Hearts game. <laughs> of course it does. See, I think it would be interesting, and, and tell me if this happens, Jacob. If if it happens, and then the other play, uh, player that you're playing is like completely different control style, so like it's like completely jarring you have to like completely start from uh, start from scratch it's not like your character do you know what i mean like it's not yeah. like your weapons changed and it's you know just a different avatar of you it's like really a different game i don't think that's happened the closest thing i can think of is was a game i'm gonna spoil the game brothers from from six or seven years ago it is a game about uh two brothers who are on, on a journey together and it has this very complex control scheme where um, half the controller controls the older brother and the other half controls the younger brother. And I, I hope I'm not misremembering this. It's been so long since I played it. But um, in the towards the end of the game, the older brother dies and the younger brother has to finish the game on his own. Uh, but, for the, but for the rest of the game, you can use both sides of the controller to control the younger brother. And it's the realization that the gameplay mechanic of the younger brother inheriting all the his brother's controls is him using what his brother taught him in order to finish their journey. So it ends up being a mechanical choice that actually has a really moving, you know, emotional effect on the player. That's pretty awesome. Okay. Well, we will put a link to the trailer for Cuphead. If you haven't seen that in the show notes, you can find more of all of our work at slash com. You can find this podcast Slash Home Daily, published every weekday on iTunes, Google, Overcast, Spotify, all the popular podcast apps. Please feel free to send your feedback, questions, comments, concerns to us at peter at slash home.com. And please head on over to our iTunes page. Give us a five-star review. Tell your friends. Spread the word. And we'll see you tomorrow. Hey. Hey, Peter. Yes, Jacob? Uh, I, I've opened up uh, the gargantuan book of insult, offense, and affrontery by Lewis A. Safian. And I've opened it up to the show offs section. What does that even mean? It's, it's like show off, but they've replaced the off with oh. oaf. Huh. So he's trying to be even clever in even, even just the titles of the chapters. Look, listen to some of these put downs, and you and you can tell me for sure if you don't think Louis A. Safian is the most clever man on earth. Because yeah. Peter, you can never be a janitor. You're always putting out an oversupply of hot air. Uh, wait. <laughs>
But I don't understand. Like, what is hut? Uh, well, can someone ben, explain that to me? I, I don't understand. Ben, like, if I'm a janitor and I put out an oversupply of hot air, that doesn't make that doesn't. I, like janitors don't traditionally uh, clean up hot air <laughs> anyway. So, like, what do those two things have to do with each other? Yeah. It's a janitor who carries balloons. <laughs> well, someone once told Ben to be himself. He couldn't have been given worse advice. Uh, All right. right. (laughs) HT thinks she's a siren, but she only sounds like one. Hey! (laughs) And that Chris, he's a real clamor girl. What? (laughs) Yeah, I don't get that one either. Jacob, I feel like that is... I feel like you have to stop, like, forever. This has to come to an end. Please, for God's sake. Are you marking off the pages, like, so you know, so you don't repeat any? I remember each page, actually. I've, I've, I've opened it a few times to a page where I recognize some of the jokes. And uh, each jo- each page has, like, 30 jokes on it. So even if I open to the same page, I, I just won't use ones I've used before. So you're saying that, like, what? It, how much? How many water cooler podcasts do we have to record for you to actually run through every single joke? I think probably tens of thousands. <laughs> I mean, I guess we could do that, guys. Right? Yeah, it sounds like a challenge. Let's make it happen. Well, Peter, you're so boastful that every time you open your mouth, you put your feet in. <laughs> your feet. I, I, oh, I get it. Yeah. Oh, oh, that one. No, I'm not sure that's clever. Is it clever? Of course, it's clever. It's written by Lewis fucking Sapien. 